Oh. 
Give the Lord some praise right where you are this morning. Hallelujah, Lord, you're worthy. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, friends and family watching us live stream on either Facebook or our web page. Let me start by first off saying happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. You are the superheroes of the day. I thank you for your devotion, your patience uh, in probably one of the most bizarre Mother Day settings you'll ever have, uh, where... <laughs> um, you actually get to spend yet another day with your kids today in lockdown. So happy Mother's Day. Uh, I hope they treat you right. Perhaps the greatest gift they can give you is just, you know, two hours of not hanging out with you. I don't know. I hope you have the best Mother's Day ever. We love you this morning. We appreciate you. Um, I loved the video where it uh, just showed how moms are so much like Christ as you clothe us and feed us and take care of us. So moms, thank you. We love you this morning. We're glad you've joined us. Um, for those of you who are joining us this morning, good morning and welcome to the storehouse. Hold on one moment so I don't hurt myself. Um, just a few reminders today before we get into the word this morning. Um, if you're watching us on Facebook or our website, a couple things. If you're watching us on Facebook, share this video with your friends so that they know what you're watching and perhaps they'll be encouraged to join our broadcast here this morning at the storehouse. Um, leave some comments along the way, just some encouraging words. Not, that's not for me, it's for each other. Let each other know that you're watching and let them know, let each other know that as the Lord has spoken to you through the spoken word this morning, that... Um, just share that. Share your thoughts. Share something that God's confirmed in you. Let people know you're here. And uh, let's encourage one another in the Lord this morning as we continue to practice a little bit of social and physical distancing today. Um, if you're on board from somewhere other than Central Florida, we love to know where you're from. Just drop a quick line saying, hey, I'm watching from Honolulu, Hawaii. That would be wonderful. Or Key West. Or, uh, you know, Puerto Rico. So some mountain somewhere, just drop us a quick line of where you're watching from. If you haven't been on our website recently, make sure you check out uh, thestorehouse.church. Uh, Miss Samantha Bird has been doing an amazing job getting the website uh, really looking the best it's ever looked. 
Videos are already uploaded. Last Sunday's sermon is on there. Uh, this Sunday's sermon will be on there. It's probably already on there. She's that good. She's probably already posted today's video with all of the message ahead of time. So join us at the storehouse.church. Uh, there's a prayer wall. You can leave requests. There's a, um, there's a request to join our Wednesday night Bible study and our Sunday morning Bible study. We'll send you an email invitation to the Zoom calls if you fill out a few simple questions. There's a giving tab on there that'll take you right to Tithely, which is our electronic giving application. Um, what else am I missing? There's a page on there for our Revelation Kids Ministry, our Women's Ministry, our Guardsmen Men's Ministry. This website of important information, so make sure you check it out. Um, also, uh, I'm sure Samantha's watching. She's going to probably put up uh, during this broadcast our link to our YouTube channel. We have a new YouTube channel for the Storehouse Church. If you haven't done this yet, I need you to click on that link. Go to the YouTube channel. It's going to house all of our videos and some other things going forward. Once you're there, I need you to hit that subscribe button. Um, just going on doesn't make you a subscriber. You have to actually hit that button that says subscribe to this channel. If we can get a hundred people, then we get a URL address with our name in it. Right now, if you type in the storehouse, it's not going to take you to our channel. So we need a hundred subscribers. Um, so I'm sure Sam will put this up on our Facebook page. There's also a link for it on the sermons page of our website. So just go to YouTube. Click that subscribe button. Uh, it's not obligating you to anything. We just want to be, we just want people to be able to find, it and it will take you to the YouTube channel. So thank you so much for that. Now we love having you with us today. We're going to try to go through this fairly quickly this morning, so moms have some time to go hang out with their kids and be lavished with pampering, loves love, gifts, and some delicious food that somebody is going to create for you. And every mom out there said, Amen, I'm ready to be celebrated. All right, we are in a series, uh, we are in week two of a new and a short series that we're doing. We're kind of setting up, <laughs> I know I've said this for like seven months, but we are heading towards the book of Acts. We're plodding our way to the book of Acts. That's all I can say. We're getting, we're trudgingly getting there. But every time I want to launch the series, the Lord says, no, let's set this up first and let's set this up. And uh, I promise you that we're setting this up to go into the book of Acts full blown, which is probably going to take us easily through the rest of the year. So it's important to know what transpired heading into Acts. So what we started last week, and uh, our series is called Critical Download, and we're focusing on this. We're focusing on the last evening that Jesus spent with the disciples. I asked the question last week, if you knew the exact time on earth that you would be leaving this earth, how would that impact your life? And then I asked this question, if you knew that next Sunday you would not be among us, how would that change your life? If you had less than a week before your death, would that change your priorities? Would that change your conversations? I think it would. I know for me as a husband and a father and a pastor, I would spend all of my energy pouring my life and experience and scripture and instructions into the people I love to set them up to be ridiculously successful in God's eyes while I'm away. And in essence, that's what Jesus is doing in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and then he prays for the disciples in John 17. So we're, we're examining those chapters and looking at what Jesus poured into the disciples, and we call the series critical download, because when you know your time is limited, you don't waste time, you get right to the point. Last week was week one. We kind of parceled this out into topics. So last week the topic was, Jesus told his disciples, I am going away. And this news uh, baffled them and confused them and made them sad. And they didn't understand what he was talking about when he said, I am going away. Now, I'm not going to rehash the sermon. You can check that out on our website or our YouTube channel. Um, but I do want to cover some points. Because how do we relate? If, if we can't relate the Word of God to us, to my life, to your life, 
then we're kind of missing the point. So when Jesus is explaining to the disciples that he must go away, we brought some practical points home last week. We're all going to go through times when it appears as though and it feels like Jesus just isn't there. Now we know being on the other side of the cross and the resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But I also know that there are times when we feel very much alone. We feel like while he may not have abandoned us, he certainly isn't paying attention. But you know, I want you to realize some things about the goodness of our Lord. Number one, when we start feeling that way in the absence of Christ, we need to trust God and trust in Jesus. Even when we can't see him or feel him working, we need to trust that God is moving behind the scenes. Secondly, we need to remember his promises. You can't remember what you don't know, so we need to know his promises. We need to know that he promises to never leave us or forsake us. He promises to meet our needs. We need to know what the word of God says, and then we need to rely on those promises as we go through the darker times and the, and the, and the tougher times in our life. Thirdly, we need to not be troubled and not be afraid. We're emotional creatures, and it's okay to be emotional. God is emotional. I'm emotional. You can ask my wife. I cry at sad cartoons. Not cartoons, commercials. And most commercials are pretty sad. I cry at Publix commercials. Those are the worst. Like, they just like kill me, those Publix commercials. But we can't stay in our grief. That's the point Jesus was making. He told the disciples, he said, look, I'm going away and you're going to be sad. You're going to cry. You're going to lament. You're going to wail. You're going to be grieved that I'm gone. But he doesn't let us stay there. And you know that grieving and sadness and anger, those are all okay in their time. But let's not park there. We can't stay there. Don't let that time and those emotions park us in a place where we were never intended to stay for the rest of our walk. And I've known people that have remained in bitterness and anger and they've remained in grief and sadness for the rest of their life and it deteriorated and destroyed their walk with the Lord. Don't stay, don't stay there, don't be troubled, don't be afraid. The Lord wants to move us out. Because he says at the end of that, he says, look, I know you're sad and I know you're gonna cry and I know you're gonna lament, but he says, when you see me again, you're gonna be overwhelmed with joy. And that's what God, <coughs> sorry. That's where the Lord wants to bring us through our sadness and allow the joy of the Holy Spirit to fill our life. So that was last week's review. Today we're moving on to subject number two that Jesus wants to convey to the disciples. And that's simply this. So last week he tells them, he delivers the bombshell, I'm going away. He also kind of tells them, but don't worry, I'm coming back. But I don't think they really hear that. It's evident by their scratching of their heads and their mumbling to each other that they're not getting the fact that he's coming back. So then he says this to them, I'm going away. But then he says, I'm sending some help. I want you to hear this this morning, that he's sending you some help. He has sent us some help. There's a slide for this that says, I'm sending help. There it is. Let's pick it up in John chapter 14. Jesus says this to the disciples. He says, if you love me, you'll do what I command. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth. The people of the world cannot accept him because they don't see him or know him. But you know him. He lives with you and he will be in you. So we're going to kind of take this uh, verse by verse this morning and break down what the Lord is telling us by telling the disciples of why we need the helper. So a couple things I want you to see this morning. Number one is this. The Holy Spirit is a gift to the believers. Yeah. Let me put this in perspective because this is really cool. God sent his son to the world to save the world. The Bible says that while we were yet enemies with God, he sent his son into a hostile environment to save you and I. While I was yet a sinner, 
God sent his son for me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't uh, ask for it in most cases. But while I was still at enmity, while I was an enemy of God, he sent his son because he knew my need for Christ. But he gives us the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. And it's a gift. There's a qualifier. There's two qualifiers. It's a gift to believers. I really like what, what, how the Lord phrases all of this. So let me, let me show you some points here, okay? First thing I want you to see is we see an outstanding example of the triune Godhead working together. Jesus said, look, I have to go away. And I, it's imperative that I go away because when I go away, I'm going to ask God and he's going to send you, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. So here's a wonderful picture of the, 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 the Godhead, the triune Godhead working together. Jesus the Son approaches the Father, and I love how a lot of versions say this. He doesn't say, I'm going to, some versions say, I'm going to pray the Father pray to the Father for the Holy Spirit. But if you look at the original word picture, what he's saying is, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to request of my Father that he give you the Holy Spirit. It's much more intimate than how we think about praying. Jesus was praying in the garden. Jesus often went to the desert to pray. Jesus often went to the wilderness to pray and learn the will of the Father. This is a little bit different connotation in that he's going to the Father and he's requesting, send them the Holy Spirit as a helper. Give them the help of the Holy Spirit. So there's an intimacy there that can only take place among the triune Godhead. We see the Son asking the Father to send the Holy Spirit. He's not praying like we think of praying. He's requesting. A couple of stipulations, though. Number one, we need to be believers. God didn't send the Holy Spirit into the world. He says the world is not going to see Him. They're not going to recognize Him. But you know Him because He's already been working in your life. But before that, there's another stipulation. And we don't often connect this, but He says this. If you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commandments. Then I will go to the Father and request that he sends and gives you the Holy Spirit. I believe one of the prerequisites to receive the Holy Spirit, the mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit, is we need to be walking in obedience. He doesn't force himself on anybody. We need to be walking in obedience. Jesus goes on to say, the world won't know him, but you already know him uh, because he lives in you. What does that mean? How do we know the Holy Spirit was in the disciples? Very quickly, we know because of this. They were already comprehending and understanding what Jesus was teaching them. Do you know that you can't grasp the word of God without the assistance of the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit that enlightens the word of God to us and gives us comprehension. So the Holy Spirit was already revealing to the disciples that Jesus is the Messiah and that he was the anointed and chosen one. And he will be in you, Jesus tells them. Uh, and that is simply the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in, our, in, in us. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit in present tense and future tense. He's with you now. He will be in you in the future. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning because we spent a lot of time on that when we studied the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But know this, he is working in your life now as a believer, giving you understanding, comprehension, and insight as to the will and the word of God. Then there's additional times if you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit will come upon you and anoint you with, with special and dunamis power. Uh, in, in, on, on occasions that is working in a different way in your life. But that's a whole other series of, um, of studies that we can get you caught up on later. So number one, the Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer. Stipulations are we must believe and we must walk in obedience. John 14, 25 and 26 says this, and this is our, going into our second point. I have told you all of these things while I'm with you. But the Helper will teach you 
everything and cause you to remember all that I told you. The helper is the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, in my authority, at my urging and my request. My Father will give you the Holy Spirit. So the second thing I want us to see this morning is believers. Remember, this is all about how does this apply to our life. Two things I want you to see up the book of Acts and how do we apply this to our lives. Because That's where we're going here. So this is all setting up the book of Acts. So the second thing I want you to see this morning is this. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Thank God that we have a teacher that knows the author. Amen? No one can teach you more about the Word of God than the author of the Word of God. You know, my wife and I have been ministering a long time, and, 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 and I've, I thought I had heard it all until I hear more bizarre things along the way. You never really hear it all. But I, in my experience, I've had people say to me, I am not making this up. I've had people say to me, you know, I don't really, I don't read the word all the time. I don't have a regular devotion or a regular Bible study because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will teach me. <laughs> How's that going? Because <laughs> those same people usually end up coming in for counseling uh, and some help. So let me tell you what it doesn't mean. I wrote these words down. The Holy Spirit doesn't just dump knowledge into us. He could, but he usually doesn't. He reveals the word to us. What we've learned when we need the application. That's a beautiful statement. It says he's here to teach us and remind you. The Holy Spirit will teach you, Jesus says, and he will remind you. You know, we read that like it's two different things, but if you look at the original verbiage, the original connotation, it would more accurately, it conveys that this is one function and not two. And, and more accurately, it probably could be stated that the Holy Spirit, I'm sending the Holy Spirit as a teacher to remind you to make clear and bring understanding to what Jesus has taught us. That's the teaching aspect of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I know. People say, well, I don't need to have a Bible study. I don't need to read regularly. The Holy Spirit will just, He will teach me. He'll teach me what I need to know. You know what I've learned in my life that I think will apply to your life? You cannot draw from an empty well. There has to be something in there. In order for the Helper to teach us and bring us clarity, we must be students and we must be willing to learn. That requires training, discipline, effort, and diligence. We should be lifelong scholars of God's Word. I don't know, I, some of you, I know you, and, and, and I know that some of you have this craving to know the Word of God. I, I hear it in our conversations. I, you're just, you're excited about devotions. You're excited about word studies. You're excited about context. And the, you're just excited about what God is showing you as, as the Holy Spirit reveals things to you. And there's, there's, there, there's a life in the Word of God that if you tap into that, it's almost addictive. You got to have it every day. It's that, it's that craving to know around people that are like that. I think we should be like the Jews that were meeting in Berea in the book of Acts chapter 17 says this, talking about the Jews in Berea meeting in the temple. They received the message, what message? The gospel message of Christ. They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. What are you saying, Pastor? Here's exactly what I'm saying. You should be checking the word out to see if what I'm preaching is true. All right. I have no problem with that. Now, if you find me to be in error, please approach me with love and grace, and let's have some conversation. But here's the thing. I only get to feed you once a week. Sunday mornings. Maybe if you tune in on Wednesday in our Bible study, there's a little more food on Wednesday night. It's a little bit bigger meal. But if the only time you're eating is my food on Sunday morning, I can tell you you're starving to death. 
Because God's called us to dig into the Word. Search the Scriptures for yourself. Allow the Holy Spirit as the teacher to just expose those nuggets that are just priceless as you read the Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Work hard. So God can say to you, Well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed when God examines your work. Know what His Word says and what it means. That's your job. That's our job. It's our job to know what the Word says and to know what it means. How do we do that? We do that through the teaching and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's who illuminates and reveals the Word of God to us. So that was point number two. Let's move on to point number three. John 15, 26 says this. I will send you the Helper... I will send you the Helper from the Father. The Helper is the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father. When He comes, He will tell about me. Third thing I want you to see this morning about the Holy Spirit is He will always testify of Christ. He is here to affirm and confirm. He will testify of Christ. He's the Spirit of Truth, and therefore He points to and confirms the truth. And that truth is Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. That's what Jesus said. So everything the Holy Spirit is sent to us, given to us to do, is to confirm and affirm that Jesus is the truth in our lives. I hope you're still with me. Say amen. So at this point, Jesus is speaking of the Spirit's role in the Apostles' life as it plays out in the next few weeks at Pentecost. I want you to think about this. The Holy Spirit is going to confirm and testify of who Jesus is. Jesus has spent over three years working in the disciples' lives every day, pouring his life into them every day. You know what I find amazing about that? God sends us a Savior. The Savior comes to us to the earth in the form of man, and he dwells among us to identify with us. He doesn't stand afar and aloof and say, you all need to come this way. Come over here. Clean yourself up and come over here. No, he comes to us. He dwells among us. He takes on our form. He's felt all of our pain. He understands everything we go through because he lived among us and then died as our Savior. So Jesus has spent three years preparing the disciples for all of for this moment in history. Now I want you to think about this. Jesus explains to them he's going away, goes to the cross, suffers a horrible, shameful public death. He's very dead and he's buried and the disciples are scattered. They have been broken, they've been abandoned, they're discouraged, and they're disheartened by the death of Jesus. So I want you to get this picture for just a moment. I believe that some of them had given up. Some thought that everything Jesus had taught them came to nothing. So how is it that these same men who were hiding for their lives broken, disheartened, abandoned, discouraged. How is it that these men would be radically transformed and change the world? Here's, they weren't radically, tra part of the transformation was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because remember, they saw him live after the resurrection. The most important part of that transformation came on the day of Pentecost when they received the baptism, the gifting of the Holy Spirit in their life. The Holy Spirit testified and confirmed everything that Jesus had taught them, and it, made them, it allowed them to make sense of his death, 
his burial, and his resurrection and confirmed and testified that he is the Son of God and he is the Messiah to the extent that it radically transformed their lives. They changed the world and all of them, with the exception of John, died a martyr's death, believing after seeing and understanding what the Holy Spirit had exposed to them, that Jesus is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will always, always, always testify of Christ. Let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Let Him confirm to you who Jesus Christ is. Let Him point to you that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. Let's go to John chapter 16, verse 5 through 7. Fourth point is this. Jesus says, Now I'm going to the one who sent me, and yet none of you asks me, Where are you going? But you're filled with sadness because I've told you all this. Let me assure you it is better for you that I go away. I say this because when I go away, I'll send the helper to you. But if I do not go, the helper would not come. Now this is a little bit of a confusing scripture because the disciples did ask him, if you remember, what do you mean you're going away? Where are you going? And why can't we go with you? They did ask that question. So you got to kind of probe this passage a little bit to understand. So the disciples had, in fact, asked Jesus where he was going. I believe this is what the Lord is doing. He is um, making a point that when the disciples asked him where he was going, it wasn't out of concern for the work of the Lord. They were asking more in protest for themselves rather than an expression of genuine interest in what Jesus is doing. In other words, let me put it to you in my terms. They wanted to know, what do you mean you're leaving? All of this and you're leaving? They didn't say this, but what's going to happen to us? How does this impact us? They weren't asking him, hey, Lord, how does your leaving align you with what are you going to accomplish when you're leaving? How is this part of your plan? What they really wanted to know is, Lord, you're leaving. What does this do for us? What do you mean you're leaving? What about us? So Jesus is saying, why is none of you asking, where am I going? Why am I leaving? It was more of a selfish concern. No one was asking, why are you leaving? Where are you going? And what is your leaving going to accomplish? What Jesus is leaving was going to do for Jesus. How do we drive that home? Well, here's what I think. This is so often what we do in our prayer life. Our conversation with God is not about what God is doing, but why isn't God doing what we want? <laughs> this is a hard point. You see, the disciples' sorrow was self-directed rather than focusing on what God is doing. And I believe that we can easily fall into the same error. That in our prayer life, we're asking God to move in ways that we think He should move. And then when He doesn't, we're saddened, perhaps upset, perhaps disappointed. But sometimes, listen carefully, our motive in our prayer life is the best outcome for us or the best outcome for the person we're praying for. Go back to when Jesus taught the disciples to pray. <laughs> he said, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth just like it is in heaven. Sometimes it's hard for us as believers to get to the point where our prayer is, Lord, all that matters is that your kingdom come and that your will is going to be done in my life, my family's life, my loved one's life, my church's, our church's life, our friend's life. Your will be done. Let's go back to the, the first point of last week. When it seems like sometimes we're walking through our darkest place, we trust God and we trust Jesus. We do that by, in our prayer life, releasing the Lord's will in situations. And guess what, church? 
Sometimes the will of the Lord doesn't look like we think it should look like. That's hard. I don't understand why this person went ahead and left and moved. I don't understand why this loved one got sick when we thought that God would heal them. I don't understand why this person passed away when we thought God was going to heal them. I don't understand how I lost my job when I know it's God's plan for us, to, for him to take care of our needs. We don't understand it, but we still nevertheless need to trust God in the big picture. and We don't always see the big picture. If you're still out there, type amen. So here's what I know. Our fourth point, I don't think I put this up here, but our fourth point was the Holy Spirit will shift our focus. Jesus focused from, what do you mean you're leaving? What's going to happen to us? He's shifting their focus to, I need to go away. If I don't go away, I cannot send the Holy Spirit to you. You will not have the helper and you're going to need the helper because when I go away, this now becomes about you. And you're going to need the reinforcements that I send. It didn't make sense to the disciples at the time. Church, God's going to walk you through things that don't make sense at the time. The Holy Spirit is there to be your reinforcement and your guide. He's there to shift your focus back on God's plan and not our desires and not how we think God should do it. I've often analyzed my own prayer life and I found many times that my prayer life consisted of me asking God to move in the way that I thought he should move. For me, that's not a proper prayer life. Now my focus is shifted to where I'll ask the Lord, Father, I need you to move. Show me what your plan is. Show me what you see in this situation. And move according to your plan. So the Holy Spirit is there to shift our focus. Allow him to do that. Maybe as you're praying tomorrow, Take a journal and just write down your prayer requests and allow the Lord to shift our focus. My prayer now for people is this, I'll be honest with you. As I pray for people at the storehouse, my prayer is this, Lord, show me this person as you see this person. Because if I can see them as you see them, you'll show me how I need to be praying for what they truly need. So I challenge you, allow the Holy Spirit to shift your focus. All right, our fifth point is in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. When the Helper comes, he will show the people of the world how wrong they are about sin, about being right with God, and about judgment. He will prove that they are guilty of sin because they don't believe in me. He will show them how wrong they are about how to be right with God. The Helper will do this because I am going to the Father. You will not see me then, and he will show them how wrong their judgment is because their leader has already been condemned. Let me break this down very quickly. Three ways that the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Number one, he's going to convict the world in regard to sin. What does this mean? Let me break it down in terms of simplistic terms because I like simplicity. God sent Jesus into the darkness calling for reconciliation to the Father and declaring the cost of reconciliation. That cost was his death on the cross and we're called to be his disciples. But Jesus finds humans unwilling to respond to God's love. So how does he convict them of sin? The problem is clearly stated in John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. He says this, there is, no eternal, or, there is no eternal doom awaiting those who trust him to save them. Talking about Jesus. But those who don't trust him have already been tried and condemned for not believing in the only Son of God. Their sentence is based on this fact, that the light from heaven came into the world, but they loved the darkness more than the light, for their deeds were evil." Man, if that doesn't describe the world today, that's pretty accurate. 
So how does he convict the world of sin? He came as our only relief from the penalty of sin. But the world rejected him because they loved the darkness more than they wanted the light. That's the conviction he brings to the extent that the world crucified him to snuff out that light and eliminate the conviction. But obviously it didn't work. So number one, he was convicting the world in regard to sin. Number two, uh, he will convict the world in regard to righteousness. God has to teach us that our righteousness is totally insufficient. You know, it's hard for people to recognize the good in you and me really amounts to nothing before God. Because we don't possess any righteousness within ourselves. We do not have good works and right living apart from conforming to the will of God. This is why the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans declares this in his letter to the Roman church. He says, there is no righteous person. No, not one. The Bible says that my own righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord. There is nothing in in." There is nothing I can do in and of myself that's going to put me in right standing with God. And Jesus came to point that out. There's no good in us. It's not our works. It's not our language. It's not our charitable giving. It's not in feeding the poor. None of that puts us in a position that makes us right with God. The only thing that does that is, is a relationship with Jesus that restores our relationship into rightness with our loving Heavenly Father. So Jesus comes again. The Holy Spirit confirms that um, the Holy Spirit convicts the world according to sin because they rejected Jesus. He convicts the world of righteousness because he points out to the world that we're not righteous in and of ourselves. We can't be good in and of ourselves. Our righteousness is nothing when referenced to the depth of our sin. If the penalty of sin is death, the only... <laughs> thing that we deserved was death for our sin but Jesus paid the price so that we don't have to die for our sin and we are declared righteousness the standard of righteousness is always God it's never ourselves thirdly he'll convict the world in regard to judgment the world's priorities and values have strayed far from God's standards I think you would agree type amen the deception of the enemy Satan has distorted man's thinking and persuaded him to pursue deceitful desires. But God is the standard for judgment. Satan is already condemned for his false judgment and evaluation. And all who follow his ways and in his lies are also condemned. The Spirit would come to set the standard for proper and right judgments established by God himself. Let me just wrap it up like this. That's a lot of words to say this. The standard for righteousness, the standard for judgment is going to be the word of God. He's laid it out. We've been warned. We've been given the advantage of knowing what his expectations are. That is the standard of judgment. And Jesus played that out when he came to the earth. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. That's the judgment. The standard of judgment is going to be what Jesus fulfilled. Let's get to our last point this morning. We have five minutes. We can do this. John 16, verses 12 through 15. Jesus says, I have so much more to tell you, but it is too much for you to bear and accept right now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he'll lead you into all truth. He'll not speak his own words. He will only speak what he hears and will tell you what will happen to you in the future. The spirit of truth will bring glory to me by telling you what he receives from me. All that the father has is mine. That is why I said that the spirit will tell you what he receives from me. So let me tell you, our last point is simply this. The Holy Spirit will guide us in all truth. And this is a really important promise to the disciples. Because I want you to see something here. He says, look, 
He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going he's to pour out unto you everything that my father and I tell him to do. And he gives that promise to the disciples. All truth. So how does that play out? Well, let's fast forward a little bit. The Holy Spirit comes and he pours the truth out to the disciples and they start writing down what is now the word of God. <laughs> So he gives them all truth and all revelation that becomes the truth and the revelation that is now available for all believers. So we have a marvelous advantage being on the other side of the cross. We have the entire scriptures available to us with the revelation and illumination of the Holy Spirit. And we also have the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives, the voice of the Lord, giving us direction, guidance, conviction, prophecy. Um, and, and it's just an amazing time to be alive and serve the Lord. It's going to lead us in all truth. Paul says this in Ephesians talking about how the Holy Spirit was working. He said, if you're reading this letter then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the, master, the mystery of Christ, which has not been made known to people in other generations as it had been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and his prophets. In other words, the Lord is pouring out, Paul is saying, the Lord has poured his Spirit out on us his apostles and his prophets, and that's going to carry on for all generations because subsequently they write the rest of, they write all of the New Testament. So now we have the fulfillment of God's written word to benefit our life and move us forward and lead us in the spirit of truth. If that gets you excited, type amen. So I want to close with this this morning. The Holy Spirit plays a vital role in our life. You know, Jesus starts this whole discourse by telling the disciples that he has to go away. And it's devastating news because they don't understand. Remember, they're still on this side of the resurrection. And then he goes on to tell them, look, you're going to be okay because I'm going to send you a helper. I'm not going to leave you alone. You're not going to be orphans. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm, I like to say it this way. I'm sending reinforcements. And next week, we're going to talk the next two weeks about a couple of things that I'm really excited about, how the reinforcements help us out and, and what our role is as believers and what the disciples' role is as they go into the book of Acts. But may I say to you this morning, while you may have been feeling the absence of Jesus, may I remind you that he sent the helper. Right. And when we walk in obedience and follow his commands, he's available for all believers. He's here to teach you and guide you and change your focus. He's here to remind you of God's promises in your life. He's here to encourage you and strengthen you. Allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. He's a very real person filled with compassion and desire to pour God's plan into us. Listen for his voice as you read the scriptures, as you pray with God, as you hear other people speak into your lives, listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and be encouraged this week. Keep reading John 13 through 17. Uh, join us Wednesday night on our Wednesday night Connect Bible study at 7 o'clock. If you want to be part of that, uh, leave me a message on our storehouse website and I'll send you the link for Wednesday night. If you need prayer, send me a message, call me, text me, come by the church. We're here to pray with you. God bless you. Have an awesome week.